You are listening to Fanfare Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Track. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Lowcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to Making Tracks. This is episode 155. I'm your co-host, Mark Newbold, and joining me today is a man whose awesomeness goes up and down like the Tatooine Twins' sons. I just made that up, Mark. How are you doing? I'm very well. I don't even know the rotation period of a tattoo- of Tatooine, so I don't even know how quickly they go up and down. So it could be very quick, which is like my wit, or it could be very slow, which is just like my general intelligence. How's things with you, dude? It's been a busy week. There's all sorts of stuff going on. We're planning for celebration, both of us, different things and some shared things. News is coming out about celebration. And we've got so much to talk about in this episode. And it's going to be late because as we record, it's Tuesday. And this episode should have come out an hour and a half ago. So we're racing (laughs) against the clock as usual. Oops. All good. I'm Mm -hmm. going to do something different this episode, Mark. I'm going to say, let's get straight into the news. Because seriously, there's so much to talk about. Okay. Which is rare in January. Let's get straight into it. Big news this week. Daisy Ridley, she's at the Sundance Film Festival. She's talking to reporters about her new film. She's talking about all sorts of other random stuff. And then somebody throws out the obvious, but probably not entirely welcome question. Is there a feature for you in Star Wars? And Daisy Ridley basically says, well, I'm a working actor. I'm always looking for work. They've got my phone number. What are your thoughts on that? Because the internet kind of blew up a little bit about the thought of Daisy coming back. It's what now, the fourth year since Rise of Skywalker, three plus years now. Do you think there's the potential? Do you think she should? I think she should. Yeah. And I think that's because Ray was probably one of the nice things to come out of the sequel trilogy. And I think there's definitely a lot of potential for the Ray. I think, if, I, if I'm honest, I think of all the characters that we saw in the sequel trilogy, she's the one that makes me want to go, I want to know what happens next to her story. And yeah, you're right. Let's be fair. Daisy's kind of relatively busy. I don't say she's like super, super busy. So I'm pretty sure that if Kathleen Kennedy came and uh, dropped her a phone call and offered her a few million squid to do another Star Wars film, I think she'd probably find time in her schedule to do it. Do you think then that if she came back, two two part question really, if she came back, do you think it would be a film? Or do you think now in the age of Disney Plus, the potential for a series carrying on the sequel trilogy era is more likely than a film and second to that John Boyega kind of seems cool on it at the moment but if they came with a a really interesting storyline maybe following on that whole Jedi storyline that was hinted at in Rise of Skywalker it was hinted at in all three of them but really in Rise of Skywalker if that was prevalent maybe that would tempt him and Oscar Isaac has said if they call me and it's a great story I'm always interested in telling great stories if they did come back if they could get the power trio back that maybe it would be more likely to be a TV thing than a movie thing I think if you end up getting all three back you'd probably want to shoot for a film be it a single standalone or at least a a standalone with the option to do more in the future without kind of falling into the trap of saying this is a trilogy if it's one or the other or, or maybe a couple of them Probably more uh, a Disney Plus streaming show. You know, we've seen Oscar Isaac in Moonlight, and so we know that he's not opposed to doing that. I I think it will probably depend, won't it? It's a difficult thing because at the moment, we've just come out of a period, really, of knowing where things were kind of going with Star Wars to an extent, because obviously you were like, well, we just had episode seven, so we're going to have eight and nine. And now we're into this weird kind of territory of getting shows, but there hasn't been any announcements thus far this year for films and obviously we're only really a few weeks away now from star celebration europe yeah. it's a bit interesting but i think that it wouldn't be any time soon i think you'd be probably looking in the middle to like late future so i'm thinking maybe three or four years away at best if i'm honest because i think the one thing that has worked well with the prequel trilogy and just Star Wars in general is that you almost let the nostalgia build up again. Yeah. You kind of let the films come out, everybody gets hyped, 
everybody has a good time and gets excited about it. And then it kind of has a bit of a lull. And then suddenly, five or six years' time, they do an announcement. And that starts to get people kind of remembering where they were 10 years ago and what they were doing and stuff like that. You know, I mean, I, I look back massively fondly as to what I was up to around the turn of the century when the prequels were coming out. And they did that. You know, I mean, The Force Awakens was just literally, it was a case study on how to really dial in the nostalgia factor and get people back into the cinema who maybe haven't seen a Star Wars film or haven't even thought about a Star Wars film for 20, 30 years. So I'd like to see her, absolutely. If they did that, if they go to the cinema, yeah. they do essentially Skywalker, a Star Wars story. They do <laughs> a one-off, you know, a one-off film about Ray and Poe and Finn in that era. Or if they do wave around the big dollars and it's enough of a law and enough of a business proposition to do it as a, a limited series, maybe like Obi-Wan, then, then you could have something on Disney+. Plus, But... Given that you are moving on, there's always the potential that Alec Guinness came back to Empire Strikes Back after dying in Star Wars, the same way that Hamill came back to Rise of Skywalker after dying in Last Jedi. Presumably, there's the option that Hamill could continue as as, mm. as Force Ghost Luke with the benefits of technology now improving. We've got Indy coming this year with Dial of Destiny. It's looking amazing what they've done with him. Potentially, they could do something with Carrie, presumably with the permission of Billy and the family, if they want to go down that road. So the options for storytelling is, is blue sky, isn't it? There's some real great options ahead if they want to do it. Well, absolutely. And you f- also forget an Adam Driver, you know. I mean, he of could course. come back. Now that he was redeemed at the end of Rise of Skywalker, why not bring him back? And actually, I think if you're going to go and try and dial him back, that's what you do. I mean, obviously, there's only so many times you can go to the Mark Hamill well, really. Obviously, it's going to be amazing whenever you see Luke on screen. And we saw that at the end of season two of Mandalorian. I would be more surprised if they actually thought about using Carrie in this way. Admittedly, in the end, kind of almost through the expanded universe, like Ray had a better, stronger relationship with Leia. But I think it would be, I don't know, I don't know if... I don't know if they're willing to do that. Like you said, it raises lots of questions. And it's questions that we've discussed time and time again, you know, about what do you do with a character when the actor has, has passed away? And is the character bigger than the actor? And um, yes, they can do it with the fake and, um, you know, AI and all that kind of stuff to bring Carrie back. It would be nice to see Leia utilised in a more story-centric way than really what she she kind of was used in The Rise of Skywalker. But that was a few years ago and we're, you know, that was at a very rusty end of a saga and they needed to kind of like keep her in it just to kind of like have a bit of resolution. Whereas I think if they didn't necessarily need to do that and they could have found a way to have written her off, off screen, that might have been better for the story a little bit. Well, I jokingly mentioned Skywalker, a Star Wars story. Yeah. Jonathan Kasdan has just finished working on Willow, but of course he was one of the writers on Solo, a Star Wars story. And he's been speaking this week about Willow, but has also asked questions about Star Wars. And one of the questions he was asked was, of the characters from Solo, which one would he like to see return? And he mentions Emphis Nest. He thinks there's definitely more that they could do with her. He's, he's clearly a big fan of Andor, likes the little link between Solo, Han, Solo being on Mimban, and Cassian being a chef on Mimban. But the big question was, obviously Maul was a huge cameo. Did he have to fight to get that get that character in there? Or was it planned from the start? And Jonathan says, it was something I wanted. My dad was more unsure as he's old school and comes from the first three movies and had less of a relationship with the later ones. I told him, no, no, this is going to be great. You're going to love this. By the time we were done, he brought into it fully and Maul is my favourite part of the prequel trilogy. I thought he was such a fun and rich character, and I remember the excitement so clearly after seeing that design in the trailers for the movie, anticipating that character and wanting more from him. Getting the opportunity to squeeze him in there was a way that felt connected to the larger lore, and it was irresistible to me and to Ron, Ron Howard, he felt exactly as I did. Just looking back at Solo now, it's 2023. That film came out in 2018. We're nearly at the five-year anniversary, but around the time of celebration, it's five years. You kind of alluded you know, in our previous conversation about what movies are coming. We don't really know what's ahead of us other than season two of this and season one of that. Do you think that putting Maul in Solo was, was a great movie, it was a big moment, and it was a, a cool reveal that's never really been followed up on? Do you think that there's the potential? Of course there's the potential, but do you think there's the likelihood that we'll see maybe not just a continuation of the solo film, but the, the, the storyline that was laid down with just that Crimson Empire and Hidden Empire and War of the Bounty Hunters and all that stuff that's thrown all these characters, Crimson Dawn and all these characters together. Referring to more being in solo, do you think we will see more of that? Mm, it's one of those things, isn't it? The, the more cameo at the end of Solo is 
fairly a decisive thing for for a lot of people they were like wtf how is he back for those who aren't really in the know we've seen him resurrected back in the clone wars so just to see him on screen kind of felt like that was kind of some kind of justification a payoff to to having him brought back in the clone wars and then in rebels you kind of think that if you're going to bring somebody like maul back onto the big screen you're not just doing it for a cameo it was very much hinted at that you know there was a, a much bigger continuation of the story for kira at the end of solo so i think yeah, yeah i mean there's something to be said for having a like a strand isn't there really rather than having um direct sequels so you know let's take acolyte for example yes this first season could be focused around 80 years before the phantom menace yeah there's there's nothing stopping them from saying right season two jumps forward 30 <laughs> years and it's now about maul between him dying in rebels and Obviously, what we see, you know, in Solo, it could be something like that. The whole criminal underworld thing, even though we've just had the book of Boba Fett, still doesn't feel like we've really delved that deep into it. It kind of felt like the book of Mm. Boba Fett was kind of like scenery. It was like, you know, something to hang the story off of a little bit. But really, the the story was focused on the character of Boba Fett. Give him some kind of purpose in a world where we've already got Din Djarin, who is basically the modern day Boba Fett. So, you know, I think the whole criminal underworld thing, you could still mine for some really good Star Wars. And I think have Maul as a centre of it. I think would be a fantastic idea. What, I, love what do you your, I love your thought, though, that you say about the Acolyte, that because the title of the Acolyte doesn't refer to a specific person, it, it kind of will, like the Mandalorian refers to Din Djarin, but the Mandalorian as a title doesn't have to refer to Din in the same way that the Acolyte doesn't have to refer to a specific person. So you're absolutely right. They could do a season one and then step it forward 20 years and the Acolyte could be another person and step it the third season forward another 20 years. And maybe it is more, there's some logic to that. I think that's there's probably something in that. They're not boxed into a corner completely with just one character. Yeah, see, I'm not just a pretty face. You're not, not even. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Andy Seacom, otherwise known as a what And you're listening to Fanta Tracks. So sad news, Ted Weston from Star Wars A New Hope, he played Merc Sunlet in the Star Wars Cantina, has passed away. He was a fixture on the convention scene. He worked on the original film. He was a crew member who was dragged in, essentially, called in to uh, wardrobe and costume to put something on to be a background player in the cantina, not knowing that his character would go into Star Wars Legend. He was a regular, as I say, on the UK convention scene, and uh, our friends at Imperial Signings shared the sad news. I met him a couple of times at different shows. Did you ever have the good fortune to meet Ted? Yes, I did. I mean, I met him in passing, uh, rather than get an autograph from him, unfortunately, but he was really nice, and like you said, he you know he worked as a prop man on loads of films, like Superman, and in fairness, quite a few Bond films. Diamonds Are Forever, I think he, was, he did stuff for Spy Love Me, Moonraker, and the... Uh, not very often mentioned, never say never again, as well yeah. as like, you know, Willow and stuff. So, you know, he had a pretty prolific career in that. I mean, obviously he has a bonus and um, retirement fund that is uh, being able to kind of fall back on Star Wars and do a few signings now and again. And he was, yeah, just a really nice guy. Some folks like Ted had such an interesting career across so many different genres and different films and then ends up being known for a passing, glancing moment. You see his face, so there he is. His face is on screen, but just his passing moment in Star Wars, just because it's Star Wars, it, it's crazy, isn't it? You interviewed Michael Culver last week, who was in The Empire Strikes Back 40 years ago, and you know, and you, you totally think that you know he was cast for that and he even had auditions, and you know that was probably slightly more memorable. But to be fair to, to Ted, this could just be some a random day in the office, just slightly different from the normal hubbub that you have when you're working in film so therefore it might stand out a little bit but yeah i bet he probably didn't think anything of it until mid 90s or something when he starts kind of going on the the circuit but that's cool i think it's nice and i think we need to take the time to talk to all the cast and the crew members it doesn't matter if you're in one scene in the cantina at the back or if you're darth rick invader or something like that we're now in the point whereby we're getting to where a lot of the history will be second-hand, will be slightly revisionist because mm. the people who were there at the time are no longer with us. To be able to capture that through interviews like you know we do on Favtracks or just by talking to them at a convention, I think it's definitely worth taking time to do it. It kind of gives you that closer touchstone to, to I think, you know the films that we all love by actually having a chance to kind of go and meet and uh, and, and chat to these people. So, yeah, it's a, it's a sad time, sad sad loss for, for Star Wars and the, uh, and the community. 
Hi, this is David W. Collins, voice actor for Star Wars and sound designer at Skywalker Sound. You are listening to Fanta Tracks. So on today's episode, we have the good fortune to catch up with Paul Casey. Paul was at Wales Comic Con. We had a chance to sit down with him, talk about his career, both in and outside of the Star Wars galaxy. So here's myself and Paul Casey chatting about life, the universe and everything at Wales Comic Con. Right, we're here at Wales Comic Con. I'm here with Paul Casey. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very good. And I'm so glad to be here. Yes. It's nice to get out again. I mean, obviously, we're, we're a while past, you know, the world locking down. But have you been out to many events? What have you been up to lately? Um, yes. So last weekend I was out in Stuttgart and I was at a, quite a large, you know, event there, yeah. which was amazing. And then this one here in Wales, um, which was a last minute thing, actually. I don't think I got released until last Sunday. So it's... Yeah, so I was asked to come along and I was like, absolutely. And I just love them because you just get to meet people, you get to chat. It's the questions you get asked. And I just love to sort of give them everything I know and what's gone on and stories and everything. And that's what it's about. So I I mean, just listening to you talking to a fella about uh, 28 days later, 28 weeks later. films, You know, and there's always, as you say, a story to tell. When you got into this industry... What was the first, well, there's a question. What was the first thing you did when you got into it? So, way, way back, many, <laughs> many years ago. So, I trained professional dancer, singer, actor, yeah. and I was a gymnast contortionist. So, the first part of my career was being a professional dancer, basically. Right. So, it was West End shows, the sort of hair shows, the corporate shows. Yeah. TV dancing, you know, top of the pops. I mean, it was that whole world. And then I went on to sort of start choreographing and lecturing at colleges. And and then I was actually in a West End show. So I was in the Bob Fosse tribute show um, in town, which was the most amazing show for a professional dancer. Um, I don't think I could have asked for any more in the world of dance. It was just phenomenal. And that was the last year Gwen Verdon actually taught a team of people um, because it was that year she passed away. So that was truly amazing. And I just happened to get a call from an agent for an audition for a movie. And I didn't know what the movie was, but they were looking for physical performers. I mean, I'd heard they were auditioning dancers, stuntmen, movement actors, gymnasts, contortionists. I mean, they were just auditioning everybody they could basically in Europe and in the UK Um, so I did the first round didn't know what it was and the second round was when the producers and the director came over and the director was Guillermo del Toro right? and it was Blade 2 wow okay and when they were trying to fit me in my slot to do the recall in front of Guillermo it was a Saturday and I had two shows because I was still in, in the Fosse show yeah so they fitted me right in between in between my shows. And I remember finishing the show, getting changed, sweating from the show, yeah. running to Pineapple Dance Studios, doing my recall, yeah. um, and then running back to do the second show. And then I didn't hear anything because, you know, that world of movies, yeah. you know, I was my world was dance and theatre and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, so I didn't hear. And then three weeks later... My agent calls me and says, you've got it. And, and you've got the Guard Reaper on Blade 2. Oh, wow. So um, that was amazing. So that was my first introduction to movies, yeah. that world of movies, and sitting in the makeup chair for four hours every morning having the prosthetics fitted. And what kind of, because you, you come from a world that's very, it's immediate and it's live and the crowd are right there and then you've got to change tempo to have the patience to sit in a chair for four hours and yeah, then go out and do yeah. what you're doing. How was the switch between those two things? Um, maybe I'm naturally patient because over the years, like lots of people have said to me, you're so patient and you're so calm. So maybe it was just a good fit for me, you know. Because um, it's I not do, for everyone, is it? No, no. So originally I was contracted on Blade for 12 weeks and then Wesley had um, a fight rehearsal right. and hurt his knee. So they had to pause for, I think, about three weeks. Yeah. So my contract got extended by three weeks So I, you know, to finish the movie. And, um, and I remember one day sitting in my trailer, just, I just loved it. I just loved that whole world of prosthetics and creatures. 
the clarity of movement and yeah. what was needed and the intensity of it. And I just truly loved it. And I remember thinking to myself, because it was a world I wasn't a part of, but I was just thinking, I wonder if there's other stuff like this, if there's other stuff out there. Yeah. And then another agent of mine, before I finished Blade, called me and said, um, Danny Boyle is doing auditions for a movie. Right. Um, we know you're busy, but he's happy to meet you. So when I flew back from doing Blade, I literally had a meeting with Danny. We had a good old chat. I mean, he's amazing. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. And, um, and he was like, do you want to come on board? Do you want to be a featured infected in this movie? And I was like, absolutely. So basically what happened then, the, the scales just started to tip yeah. because then what came was I auditioned for Doctor Who and then started to play more creature roles on Doctor Who. And yeah. so my diary just became more... I suppose, fuller of creature work. So when I was being called to do the dance stuff or choreographing shows or whatever, yeah. I just wasn't available. Yeah. So the scales just started to tip. But I was truly immersed in a world that I truly loved. Yeah. Because don't get me wrong, the creature world, it is definitely challenging. Yeah. No day is the same. Every, every suit is different. They all come with different challenges, but I truly loved it. The challenge. Yeah. You know, whether that be limited vision or limited hearing and the movement side of yeah. it. And my, my, my bottom line is yeah. a lot of what I play is not real. Yeah. But my bottom line was I'm going to make that look as real physically yeah. as I possibly can to make it correct for the human eye because the human eye is very clever yeah and you're visually seeing something that we don't know but if you can attach the movement that makes people go well i actually believe that yeah and that's that was where my mind was at if you see what i mean and and i loved the makeup the prosthetics the animatronics i mean all those different you know things that i've worn over the years it was yeah truly amazing and then then i was lucky to be a part of the opening ceremony of the Olympics in yes. 2012. So that was more movement, like the devising of the opening ceremony, which was amazing. There was Danny, obviously, who was directing. Yeah. Toby Sedgwick was sort of the movement director, choreographer, and then he had a team of 10 people, and I was one of the 10. Yeah. Um, that was an amazing experience. And, um, and then Star Wars came along. Yes. So... Um, <laughs> So, you know, I suppose my back catalogue was movement and creatures. And so then, yeah, I mean, five movies of Star Wars, which, yes, I, I feel very blessed. There is no doubt about it. I look back. I mean, I think everyone wishes they had a crystal ball to sure. look into the future. For everything in one location, daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds, bookmark fathatracks.com. For Star Wars News 24-7, 365. And now there's been another slight shift in my career because now I get asked a lot more to sort of work with actors. I mean, I always get the oddities of movement, the sure. complexity of the oddity of movement yeah. to work with actors. But then also I think my knowledge and understanding of creatures and what performers need and the movement of them. Yeah. So I get asked to do that, you know, a lot more now. But it's, I'm it's more than happy to jump into a suit. <laughs> It's a perfect storm, though, isn't it? The way you describe it, you, you bring, you're bringing an authenticity and as much of a reality as you can in, in the dance world, let's say, because that's a specific yes. skill. And then you translate that. I'm thinking honesty is the word, because like yes. you say, you've got to convey a creature that doesn't exist and make yeah, it feel like yeah. Eloasti is real. Like, you know, these things are real. Yes. All of what you've said does mix Yes. In a nice big casserole of yeah, where you yeah. are now. Yeah. I mean, you know, the dance world, it's very precise. That's what you're working for because, yeah. you know, if you're 10 dancers, you've all got to be clean and, yeah. and precise. And I think that clarity of movement you take forward, your spatial awareness, yeah. and I mean, the mapping of where you are on stage. I mean, all of that world, yes. It's like, I suppose I've gathered tools yeah. and I've taken them with me. And, you know, and now I suppose the experience, I mean, Blade was about 22 years ago. So yeah. I've been playing Creatures and Monsters for about 22 years now. And, and yeah, and now helping others. 
achieve the best they can in, in you know, what their yeah. limitations are. Yeah. But, you know, I'm a great believer there's so much you can do and achieve with limited or no vision. Right. And I say no vision because there's only one character I've played that had no vision at all, and that was Admiral Radus. Ah, how strange. I was literally going to mention Radus. Yeah. Obviously, Rogue One, people adore that film. Andor's just come out. Yes. People have really dug that. Season yes. two's happening, and yep. the hope is that we see the, the Admiral at some point in the future. Yes. Um, what are you working on right now? What's, what's the latest so, thing? So, at the moment, um, so I worked on the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. Yeah. I've worked on that as a, a movement choreographer. Um, I'm now about to start the new series with Shooty and Millie. Yeah. Um, and having like two roles, really. So a movement coach for the actors and a movement choreographer for the creatures. Right. So, um, I mean, who knows what might come along in the creature world that yes. I might get asked to play. I mean, touch wood, I do get asked because I truly love it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. But... Um, you know, most re- recently, probably over the last couple of years, I mean, I was lucky to work on the second season of The Witcher. Yes. Then I went on to an Apple Children's TV series, then went back to The Witcher to work on a new series called Blood Origin, which is the pre-story to The Witchers yeah. and working with the actors. And so, yeah, it's, it's amazing, you know. There's no day that is dull, I yes. can assure you, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I love it when I'm challenged, whether that's an actor asking me a thousand questions or whether that's working out how to achieve something. That's, that's who and what I am. Yeah. And I truly love it. You know, I, the whole movement and I, I just, yeah, I love it. And the TV world and the movie world. Yeah. From what you've said... I mean, we all like we all like easy days. We all like days that are like not too stressed and challenging. From what you've described, it does sound like you kind of dig the limited vision, the tricky days, figuring it out. It sounds like you're yes. a problem solver to a degree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now more so, helping others achieve it and giving my experience to other people yeah. to get the best they can, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And, and, you know, for the production and the director and, I mean, everybody, because everybody gains. And, you know, what's on camera, we all want it to be the best it yes. possibly can be. Yeah. And I'm just that person in my field that gives 100% to everybody. And, I, you know, and that's what I love. And, I, you know, I do think to myself quite often... Whoever I work with, whether it's an actor or a suit performer or, yeah. wh- you know, whoever it is, they, I want to give them as much as I can so they can move on and upwards to, and achieve more yeah. because that's what the world is about. And there's room for everybody, you know, more so now than yeah. ever. Well, you, you just know. said you've done work for Netflix, you've done work for Apple. Yes. Obviously, there's Lucasfilm projects yes. and Disney the Plus. the BBC and, and yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a big absolutely. world. Absolutely. It is a big world and there's plenty of room for everybody. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, thanks for giving me some time. It's a pleasure, always. And we'll speak again soon. Yeah, take care. Bye. Hi, this is Vivian Lyra Blair and you're listening to Fanta Tracks. The clock is ticking. There's not that long to go. I'm not even ready. I ain't packed my bags yet. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't. It's 72 days away. But hey ho. <laughs> but there are some guests who've been announced. Seven very cool guests. Anthony Daniels, Ashley Eckstein, Matt Lanter, D. Bradley Baker, who's absolutely smashing it right now, Giancarlo Esposito, Vivian Lyra Blair, and Indira Varma. So we've got guests from Obi-Wan Kenobi, we've got guests from The Mandalorian, we've got guests from The Clone Wars, The Bad Batch, and of course, Anthony Daniels, who's been in pretty much everything. <laughs> and I think, he's been, I think I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he's been to every celebration as well. So he really is the everyman of Star Wars. What do you make to that first batch of guests? Obviously, more is going to be added over the coming weeks and months, but it's not a bad start, is it? It's a nice start because, like you said, it's a nice kind of mix, isn't it? Something something old, something borrowed, and something new. So, yeah, fantastic. These guests, they cover all the... You know, there's, there's animated guests there. Yeah. There's, there's live action, there's television. It's a good starter, isn't it? It's a solid starter. And I think what's quite nice is... It's been six, you know, six odd years since the last celebration in the UK. You yeah. think about the opportunity that some of the fans over here who haven't been able to get over to America, fans from Europe who haven't been able to get over to America and to the celebrations there. They've not had a chance to probably, you know, you know really see some of these. And obviously Giancarlo and like Vivian and uh, 
in their environment about venue, you know, their, their, their new kids on the block. I'm, I'm really excited about re-meeting some of them as well. I mean, I've met Ashley a couple of times um, and she's, in fact, I had a conversation with her at Essen before, you know, while she was setting up, she was trying to hang some clothes yes. on the I was there universe. with you, mate. I was there. You? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. And so was Brian. That's when we first met Brian Cameron. And then Brian was helping set up the shop at Essen. So yeah, there you go. And and at, right at the end of that show, you know, she sat there with a long queue, and I'm like, "What's that queue for?" And then she's just sat there, just signing anything you had. You brought up anything, and she'd sign it for free. So I've got my uh, Essen pass, like signed by Ashley Eckstein. Oh, cool. But it'll cost you 125 dollars now for, <laughs> <laughs> for the same signature. <laughs> so it's a good point, though. A lot, like you say, Giancarlo, Vivian, Vivian was over at Wales Comic Con. We did as you know, speak yes. to her in last week's episode. Indira, we've not had a chance to speak to her yet. Hopefully she'll be uh, appearing at more conventions. And the other guys are, obviously, Matt, Ashley and Dee. It's the 15th anniversary of The Clone Wars. Yeah. Anthony was in episodes yep. of The Clone Wars as well. So there's some nice sort of synergy there as well. We've alluded to plans being progressing and things mm-hmm. moving forward. Just touching on that briefly, Boontory 4, Panther Tracks are going to be podcasting there. We're going to be doing a slot. Very much looking forward to that. That's Thursday before the convention actually starts. And the Friday, the return of the bash, which is the UK Garrison 501st and Jedi News event, which is happening not that far away from the O2. There's something else happening on the Saturday night, which we won't talk about yet, but we will very soon. And then on Sunday, it is Hashtag Cantina, which is taking place at the Indigo at the O2 which is selling like hotcakes. It's looking amazing. The guest list is phenomenal. The bands are phenomenal. So outside of celebration itself, of which all these events are, we're going to be absolutely shattered, mate, aren't we? I've put, I think, a couple of days off after celebration, and I've got a feeling I might have to go into work and see if I can get the rest of the week off, because I don't think a couple of days are going to do it. I mean, I normally nah. take two days off after a three-day convention these days. So, <laughs> so I think, you know, and that's maybe having a, a few drinks in the bar after the convention and maybe getting to bed by about 11 o'clock. This will be one of these things where you'll be on fumes by Monday night, I think. <laughs> Monday Pretty night. tight. Yeah, yeah, Monday night. Friday yeah. night. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I suppose it depends on what you're drinking or snorting, I guess, really. That's but, very true. Yeah. It's very true. You know, so yeah, I mean, it's, that's the thing, it's fantastic. Um, it, and, and that's what I think probably the big difference really between, you know, this celebration and, and previous ones in, in the UK is actually there's, you know, there's quite a bit to do after conventions. You know, there's there's other little after parties and, and what, what have you, which kind of just, you know, if, if you're not a member of the costume club, it does mean that you're sometimes limited to what you can get access to. But this time it's a little bit different, so I think it's fantastic. And, you know, the lineup for Cantina 2 is, is looking good. I think this will definitely be a very long but a very fun weekend. Absolutely. We'll bring you all the news here on Making Tracks and, of course, on Thunder Tracks as we get it and when we're allowed to talk about it. There's loads of other stuff happening. Celebration's looking pretty good. Seven guests have been announced. There's definitely going to be more coming over the coming weeks. Stay tuned and we'll bring all the news to you. Hey, it's Alyssa Wong, writer of Dr. Afra, and you're listening to Fantha Tracks. So this week we have a listener's question. This is from Idris Henry in Ibiza, and the question is, do you think the Mandoverse will become increasingly intertwined with character cameos in the main show leading to spin-offs, and does that run the risk of becoming too much of a viewer commitment? So I think that question kind of alludes to season two of Mando has Ahsoka turn up, then Ahsoka goes and gets her own TV series. If you're watching season three of The Mandalorian and you're a casual viewer and you're expecting Mando to go off and search for Grogu and you've not seen the book of Boba Fett, <laughs> you might be a bit confused. So I think it's a clever question. Do you think the Mandoverse is, is running the risk of being too involved in the sense that you've got to watch everything and not just The Mandalorian? Because you said it once, mate. I've got to say, you said it beautifully. It's all Star Wars. No, it is all Star Wars and it's all one big merchandising ploy. <laughs> <laughs> but in fairness, there there comes a point, doesn't it, where it, you can easily go, well, yeah, if we put a character in a series and they're, they're getting their own spin-off, then is this kind of like a, a bit of a soft kind of pilot? You know? mm-hmm. They do that a lot now these days. You know? Star Trek used to do it a lot. It seems to be the thing. I mean, you've got that with one Chicago. So, you know, uh, Chicago Med, Chicago Fire and Chicago PD. You know, they're all independent series. But there's these little crossovers and sometimes little references that if you don't watch them, if you don't watch them in order, you're like, what was that? I don't quite understand that. So I suppose with like the reuniting of Grogu and Mando, that can easily be explained in a prologue montage thing. You do kind of go, how many times is that going to happen? Mm-hmm. And I think 
if it's live action, I don't necessarily have an issue. But it's like if they introduce a character in Bad Batch, you know, they have introduced that, and then they have a live action spin off. Yet they reference something in Bad Batch, and you know, when we go to do the round table, it's like, oh yeah, this happened in Bad Batch and stuff like that. Or even actually, kind of. I mean, it's a big Easter egg, but in you know, you think about Andor and you think about the Gorman massacre in Rebels. In Rebels, you know, and I didn't even bother going back to rewatch it, but for memory. I don't think it was a big thing then. I think it was just more of a case of a, a story point to move more Mothma along. That's right. But yeah, you know, it's talking like, well, you know, if you want to find more about that, you've got to go and watch Rebels. And I suppose it's all, you know, like I said, it's all Star Wars, so it's all interlinked. But the more shows that we end up having, the more it will be harder to keep up. And then you'll start to find people will just start to slip off the wagon because it becomes a commitment. And if you're finding that actually the second or the third season of a series isn't that good you just you stop watching it i mean i mm. i'll be honest i really struggled with like this season of stranger things you know it took us months to get through the whole thing and you know by the end of it i'm just like i'm only watching it for the master of puppets bit that's it <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah i know what you're saying it's it's tricky in the sense that you, you say commitment and when a show becomes a commitment there's a negative connotation to it Stranger Things is a, is a good example. I enjoy Stranger Things very much, and it's finishing next year anyway. But you mentioned the Chicago sh- stuff and Grey's Anatomy, and I think of NCIS and all the spin-offs from that, and especially the Law and Order scene, oh, the Dick Wolf yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, totally. He's the master of crossovers and doing it to a degree where when two characters from two shows cro- meet each other and cross over, it was an event. It became an event. And, and Star Wars is, as you say, it's all Star Wars. And and, and that's a, an even broader swathe. When you're in it like we are, it's not such a problem that they refer to something in a cartoon or, or they refer to something in a comic because there's kind of a, I know that name. Where do I know that name from? You're straight on Wikipedia. Wow, it was an issue 10 of Star Wars or whatever. You know, and you go and have a mooch around and find a bit more out. For us in the deep dive world, it's like that's absolutely fine. But when you're watching a thing in the moments and it's not explained, it's, it's almost frustrating when you feel like you should know. If you're a casual viewer, you've got no hope. If you're not a massive fan, and by that I mean somebody who kind of knows all the ins and outs or mm-hmm. enough of them to, yeah. to have a, a good working knowledge, then everything's exposition. If what the character has said has literally been written for that episode, as much as it's exposition if it's a character that was in a Marvel comic from 1978, if you don't know it, it doesn't matter what the history of the exposition is. It's still exposition, whether it's brand new or 40 years old. So for fans who can take the time, know where to look, that's a big thing, know where to look, or just interested enough to find out and get a kick out of it, that's the Easter egg that the writers go, well, I'm really glad that you realised that that planet was in an old book and record from 1981. That's really cool. If that means nothing to you, then it's just, it might as well have been written last week. So it serves two functions in that sense. But back to the question, do you think the Mandiverse will become increasingly into time with character cameos leading to spin-offs? Yeah, that was one of the criticisms that I think was held up against season two back in 2020 was that season one was, it was all new. It was all new characters. Okay, you go into Tatooine and you, you do see certain characters that you're familiar with. But for the most part, you weren't. And then you came to season two, you meet Cobb Vanth, who's from Aftermath. And later on, you meet Ahsoka. And then at the end, Luke Skywalker and R2-D2 turn up. There's characters that you're familiar with it did feel like a like a cameo fest at times, but they just about walked the line to make that not a you know not yeah, a thing, yeah, not, yeah, not yeah. a problem. It wasn't intrusive. It wasn't a problem. I think season three would be very interesting to see how they play season three, whether or not they've got enough of their own world that they don't need the celebrity cameo, if you like. Book of Boba Fett. They certainly brought Hamill back for Book of Boba Fett and, and Ahsoka back for that as well. Yeah, precisely. The question is, is that whole thing that you know we were talking about with the book of Boba Fett and having that Mando 2.5 season wedged in the middle maybe Mark was just brought back just to give that closure to that storyline because Grogu has had that temptation and they've parted ways and now he's chosen by choice to come back to the Mandalorian so therefore we kind of think now he's you know he's in it for the long haul he's committed at least with respects to staying with Din Djarin. how that all works with what we're going to see in Mandalorian season three, because you know there's that that hint, isn't there, about something big on the horizon? We were told way back before really season one of Mandalorian started. You know, that this is all going to link into and tie in together the sequel trilogy. Now, is this where we start to get some kind of hints of some kind of build up in the unknown regions that later becomes 
the First Order. Yeah. And if that's the case, who do we start seeing? Carson Taver's back, so, you know, one of the marshals. He's but you, back. you say that about the Unknown Regions and, and the remnants of the Empire sort of heading out and, and setting up this new thing. And Exegol, they seem to really want to flesh out Exegol. We've seen it in the Darth Vader comic. Okay, maybe the Emperor's not physically around at this particular point, or maybe he is, I don't know. But Snoke, there's, yeah. uh, there's been talk online of maybe this is where we see Snoke. You know, it's another thing. It's, it's a slightly off the topic, but I think it's relevant. A lot of other shows wouldn't be able to get away with what Star Wars does in leaving holes in the plot because we know at some point they'll probably they'll come back, back and fill it. Yeah, yeah exactly. they'll, mm. they'll fill it in a show now or they'll fill it with a book or a comic. Shadow of the Sith, which is out in paper back in March, did a superb job of taking Luke and Lando in that midpoint between jedi and, and force awakens and telling a yeah. story mm. that that really did tie in a lot of this stuff and link in a lot of this stuff you know it's fascinating so it'll be interesting to see how they play it in season three of mando it, it's sense of backdoor pilots that, that was the phrase i was trying to think of you know these backdoor pilots that star trek used to do gary seven was a backdoor pilot laxana troy stuff they were talking of doing a star trek sitcom essentially oh. with laxana and deanna and, and stuff you know god yeah can you imagine <laughs> There's all these thoughts of, of things that they teased and, and yeah. loads of stuff in, in next gen season six lined up or season five lined up for DS9 and stuff yeah. lined up for Voyager and so on and so forth. So it's smart if you do it right. But if it's too on the nose, I think fans pick it up. If you were to go back 20 years, could you imagine every week you'd be hit over the head with promos of like, next time on Mandalorian, Mandalorian meets so-and-so, and they will make every single cameo a big yeah. deal. You know, yeah. it'll be like an old Jedi Returns and stuff like that, and yeah. you'll be like, oh, who's that going to be? Uh, and of course, what does that do? That gets bums on seats, but yeah. which is what it's supposed to do. We're firmly in this whole mystery box, everything's a secret because we can't spoil anything kind of world, so therefore it feels a little bit more on the nose because of it. If maybe there was some kind of, you know, even just a casting announcement. If I knew that Ahsoka was going to be in that episode of The Mandalorian, it wouldn't have spoiled it for me. And there'll be some people who'll completely disagree with me on that and say, no, actually, you know, it was a good, nice surprise to see her back in there. And it was definitely kind of the way that she enters into it. It's very much a, yeah, this is meant to be a surprise. I think we'll have to wait and see. But I think they're walking the line right now. And I think but they're walking it on the right side, so I'm not really massively concerned. Agreed, agreed. We talk about the Bad Batch on the site in our group reviews every weekend. We will be bringing reaction chats back for Season 3 of Mando early March, 1st or 2nd. Let's see how quick we can get to reviewing (laughs) that one. Fingers crossed. Mm. Absolutely right. Can't wait for that season to start. It is walking the line, but it's just about getting it right. So fingers crossed they keep that, uh, that streak that they've had going so strongly. Keep that one going. And yeah, we'll be all over the Mandalorian when that arrives in March. Well, gracias, Idris, for that question. And if you'd like to be like Idris and send in a question, Mark can tell you how you can do it. Yes, I can, and here's how you do it. Thanks for listening to Making Tracks, as always. If you want to be a part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, visit fanthatracks.com or check out the free... Panther Tracks app through the App Store to follow us on your mobile device. That was a weird one. You can reach us with sending your listeners' questions by emailing radio at panthertracks.com. Like Mark just said, like Idris just did, send in a question. We'll chew it over. We'll probably answer the question completely differently to the way you expect. In fact, we'll probably make up our own questions and answer those and then come back to yours right at the end. But nevertheless, <laughs> you'll get a shout out on the show. Comment, like, and share on any of our social media feeds at Panther Tracks. Be sure to subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five star one, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Panther Tracks intro. And I'm O'Brien from Making Tracks Opening music and mark daniel and vanessa marshall for our voiceovers remember tune in to good morning tatooine it's live sunday and thursday evenings when there's a live action show on at nine o'clock uk time 4 p.m eastern on 1 p.m pacific on facebook and youtube and check out our phantom tracks radio friday night rotation it's every friday night seven o'clock uk time for new episodes of the phantom down under planet layer desert planet discs Sight your engines collecting tracks cannon fodder and special episodes of making tracks and every tuesday seven o'clock uk time for your weekly episode of making tracks and that's me done for this episode Right, that is it. So thank you very much for listening. We will be back, Mm. hopefully Tuesday. So until then, stay safe, take care, and of course, may the Force be with you. Coming up next on Fanta Tracks Radio, it's 
Desert Planet Discs.